My name's Lance. I'm the naturalist for the city of Rochester Hills. And I've had that. I recognize some more faces back there. And um, I've done that for 30 years. And we try to hold these uh, deer gardening landscape seminars every couple years. Fort Hines is always nice enough to volunteer their time and, and come and share their experiences with plants and repellents. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of what's happened in Rochester Hills, a little bit about deer biology and why you have the problems that you have, and what um, are some of the things that, that you can do strategy-wise to begin to help um, mitigate this, this problem. So, all right, we already covered that. Oh, and then Kim Mishark and Joe Douglas, are at, when I get done, which I won't ramble on too long, they're going to they're gonna come and talk to you about the plants that are the most resistant to being fed on by deer. There's no guarantee for anything depending on how motivated the deer are in your particular area. Um, can, can you still hear me? Okay. So what we're looking at here is, is a, a land use picture of what, of what Rochester Hills looked like in the 40s when it was actually Avon Township. So you can see these are all farm fields. There's wood lots. There's lots of edge cover. Um, this is basically the Fairview Farms area. This is Tinkin up to Brewster, over to Dutton, and back down. This is what it looks like today. And so, especially in the Fairview Farms and Chichester and those neighborhoods are, are probably the, the places that we get the most complaints about deer damaging gardens. And you can see why. It's got fairly large commons areas, and then densely populated everywhere else. And so this creates a, a, a perfect place for deer to run out of their natural food and go into the neighborhoods and start feeding on whatever they can find. So this program was part of what the Deer Management Advisory Committee um, they make they make recommendations to city council as to things like banning feeding deer, um, the the movable message boards that you see in the in the fall to watch out for deer in high deer crash areas. Um, so that that committee, one of the things that they wanted us to do was put on this program tonight. Um, a couple other things that happen, we do a we do a aerial survey every year where we go up in a helicopter and count the deer when there's at least four inches of snow on the ground and we we also monitor all the car all the reported car deer collisions in the city so that's what this graph is over here so you can see that there was a, there was a point in time when it was over 200 and now it well this doesn't count quite so much because we had we had a, a bad disease. How many of you were aware of the EHD that came through Rochester Hills for the second time? Then uh, you know we probably lost somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the deer. So our flyover numbers were way down. They were down almost 40 percent as were our, our, our deer vehicle crashes were also down. So um, there was a significant number of, of deer that that died from that. This is also the, the brochure that, that DMAC put together um, with the city's help, and that's available um, at the table where you came in, if you didn't see that. It just talks about some, some of the things about, about avoiding deer collisions and, and some, of the other, some of the other things. Yes? The area the square mile? Okay, he asked, he asked what... Are you talking about this graph or that one? Okay, that's the, the total number of deer that we counted during that flyover. So, you know, at, at some, some points there were over 300. Well, that was, again, that was after EHD, 
and there were we fly the same 10 spots every time so there's a historical and it's only i think it's just over a thousand acres so 300 deer on a thousand acres is a lot of deer so that's what that's what that shows we do this we do this because what, we, what we're looking for are trends in the population how 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 much is it going up? How much is it going down? How is it staying the same? And and I get these I get these questions all the time about, you know, why why is is the deer population, if it's not growing, why isn't it growing? Because some of these numbers you can see have that there are years that it goes down. What happens? That it's it's not all addition to the population. There are subtractions every year too, disease coyote uh, mortality on the on the fawns in the springtime, um, poaching, they, they have all different number of diseases, so there's, they die of old age. Um, there's, a, there's always deer being removed from the population, which is why you don't just see, now some of you might argue this, but it's not like you go out in the woods and there's 200 deer, you can't even walk through the woods. It's not, I mean, there's a lot of deer, don't get me wrong. But that's why it's not like they don't just continue to, to overpopulate because there's subtractions to the equation. So that's the story there. So this next slide is kind of interesting. Those, there's deer in the wintertime from the helicopter. This is a, a group of deer that this happens every year in the wintertime. Deer are what we call a matriarchal society. They're led by a herd doe. That's this animal right here. See how she's at high alert and she's looking off in the distance and all these other deer are kind of milling around looking toward whoever took the picture. But she, she's not worried about that. She's worried about the well-being of all these and most of them are related. And this is why from a, from a biology standpoint in the wintertime you might see 12, 15, 18 deer together because that, that's what they do. And the reason they do that is they follow the most experienced one in the herd, and all these other deer, she knows all the good places to go. She knows all the food sources. She knows all the, the places that still are trying to grow ewes and, and arborvitae and other things that they love to eat. And because deer are browsers, they just, they just take a, a, a route, and they'll, they might do that same route every single day. And if you happen to be on that route, it's extremely difficult to stop them from eating the things they want to eat. So that's what happens with, now this time of year, they start breaking up because the does are getting ready to have their fawns and they go off by themselves. The bucks are in bachelor groups as they're starting to grow their antlers. And so you don't get as, as big a groups of deer in the springtime and in the early summer as you do in the wintertime. So that's just, that's just how they behave. And um, once, they, once they hone in, one of the first calls I got when I was um, when I got this job, this woman was having all kinds of problems with the deer eating her plants, and there were all, there was all kinds of deer droppings in her yard, and she didn't like it. And so I went over there, and sure enough, there was a there was a deer trail that came from the Clinton River right straight into her backyard. And I was like, well, that's kind of strange. And I asked her, I said, did you were you feeding the deer? Because it was like a beaten down highway. And she says, well, yeah, I used to feed them all the time, but, but uh, then there was too many of them, so I stopped. I said, too late. <laughs> too late. The, the, once, once they've become habituated and used to coming to a food source, very difficult to stop them. So what we want to do is stop that from happening to you by giving you a, 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 some strategies that hopefully will, will, will help out. There's a, a doll with her fawn which they're, they're going to start having them in probably three weeks to a month. They have most of them the end of May and the first of June. She asked if, if about the 10 flyover areas and where are they. Um, real quick, they're, they're um, Oakland University. They're the uh, faculty sub that's right at the corner of, of uh, Adams and Avon. It's this site here, this 100 acres that this building's on. Um, then, let's see, Winkler Mill, North Rochester Road, Fairview Farms, Fairview Commons, Innovation, 
Innovation Park, Bloomer, and Spencer Park. No Christian Hills. No Christian Hills. We have a few yeah, I, I, I know you do. Well, because this is, we're so close to you here, and then, and then Adams and Avon is basically, those are all, Deer have a, a basic home range of a square mile, so 640 acres. So deer that are here are in Christian Hills, as are the deer that are up there on Oakland University's property right across the street, which that's probably where the biggest um, population of deer are. So fawns are getting ready. That's getting ready to happen. I, I just wanted to mention one thing about fawns real quick. If a fawn is born in your yard, and you don't see the mother, that's by design. They'll oftentimes only come back in the dark and they'll leave them for, for 12 to 20 hours at a time without feeding them because they don't want to leave their scent by the fawn as, as, as much as possible. So coyotes do like to eat fawns and uh, the, the, the mother, the doe can be quite aggressive is another part of that too. So, and we found that they're becoming more and more aggressive in, in our city to the point where they've, they've actually attacked dogs when, when they're with their fawns. And, and so um, I, I, I rescued a, a fawn that was trapped in, in a fenced in yard. I think you were there, weren't you? And it started, it start, they do what's called a fawn ball. They start crying. And when they do, the, the doe just charges you. I mean, I literally had to run and drop the fawn over the, over the other side of the fence because they're, they're she was uh, not having any of it. So fawns, if they're not making any sound, then they're fine. Because they'll, if, they, if they go too long without nursing, if like the mother actually does get hit by a car or something like that, they'll, they'll start making a, a really loud crying sound. Sounds almost like a person crying. And it's, it's extremely loud. And at that point, um, I have my cards up here, call the number on there, and, and we'll come and and take them to a rehabber. Okay, so these are some some things that I'm not going to go into too much because Kim and Joe are. But this is the this is the fence at at the community garden. It's a 10 foot tall plastic um, mesh fence. You can see with the the, the plots behind it. Um, to my knowledge, no deer has ever gotten in there. These are just deer resistant plants. Um, that are that are part of this equation, because in conjunction with other strategies, taking of the multifaceted approach, we're hoping that uh, that you can walk away with some with some ideas. These are some other some other barriers that, that these people wrap their arbs. You can see that they started wrapping them after the browse line. That's you've seen them. They look like a mushroom because the bottom part's all eaten. So they started wrapping them, and that's pretty effective, as is um, Kim and I were talking earlier about, about using barriers. Deer don't, don't like to not have room to land when they jump over something. So that's why this lower, this lower fence is, is effective, because they can't get to the plant, but there's not enough room for them to jump and land without crashing into the bush. Um, this is an interesting, how many of you been out to the new park to Innovation Hills? Quite a few of you. Have you seen this fence that we put up around this garden? It's an angled fence with multi strands. It, it, I'd say it's 90% effective. But the nice thing about it, 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 it's only four and a half feet tall, but it's seven feet wide. And so deer, deer can jump up and they can jump out, but they don't jump up and out. They can't fly. So they can come up to a, a high fence and jump a high fence, but and they can, and I've seen them. I've seen them go over, over 20 feet in a bound, but that's running parallel to the ground, not up in the air. So that's why this fence. The only thing they did do is, for a while, they were pushing through the strands and crawling through the fence, and we had to add support so that the, the fencing was tighter and they couldn't get through it. I put this up there just because. Um, that's the type of fence that we don't want people to use, the spear-pointed fence. Um, every year, Lauren and I get to take and cut deer free from the fence and take them away. So getting hooked on a, on a, on a pointed fence like that is, is not good. Um, okay. 
So these are some, some there's lots of different things to try, and, and Joe and Kim are going to go in, into that. These are some of the things that we found not to be very effective. The Irish Spring, I had a lady tell me that she hung that all around her yard, and the deer actually took bites out of it. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe don't do that. The, these uh, sound things, no. The, the coyote, adult deer really aren't super worried about, about coyotes. And you can't fool them with that anyway. You'd have to move that thing all the time. And like I said, now they, they've gotten to the point where they're not really afraid of, of, of any of that. OK. Um, we'll give you the opportunity, I promise, at the end to ask any questions that you might have. I'm going to turn it over to Kim and Joe and let them do their thing. And then we'll talk more at the end. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm glad you're all here. Um, so my name is Kim. This is Joe over here. We're going to be talking to you kind of about deer resistant plants, uh, different deer repellents, and a little bit about physical barriers. So it looks like everyone got our plant guide, got our deer resistant sheet, correct? <clears throat> I'd love to tell you everything in the plant guide is deer resistant, but sadly that is not the case. Um, <laughs> even in this sheet, there's a little bit to know about deer feeding habits, things like that. So again, there's, we grade it off. We did a couple things. So four years ago, I think, um, I think it was four years ago, we redid this sheet. So we kind of took, I think it was like 20 different articles that we found from different universities, things like that, tried to compare to what they would say would be deer resistant. <clears throat> what I found <laughs> is there was a lot of conflicting information. So like MSU would have something as highly deer resistant. Another place would have it as more susceptible. So there's a lot of conflicting information. So what does this mean? It means that deer are not very predictable on what they're going to eat. So we kind of grade it off. So you have A, which is little to no feeding damage in most landscapes. B, slight feeding damage or physical impact can occur. <clears throat> and C, occasional feeding damage with more noticeable impact. So on here, we have a graded A, B, and C. <clears throat> so if you're looking for something that's most deer resistant, you would want to go with something that's an A. Uh, slightly deer resistant, a B, and C would be a little bit less resistant. And there's things to keep in mind. So obviously, like evergreens, those are going to be fed on more in the winter months. So in summer, you're not going to see much feeding damage, but obviously in the winter, you're going to see more. So like your arborvitaes, that's when you want to protect them, during the winter. Um, you're not going to see much damage in the summer. In the summer, they're going to be going after more leafy plants. So what she's talking about, the feeding plants, like during the winter, like she started to talk about was the arborvitaes. They're going to get those because why? We don't have our hostas out. The hydrangeas aren't out. So they're going to come and get your um, arborvitaes. I live in Christian Hills, with this nice lady right here. And I've been there for 30 years. I've been at Bordines for 36 years. I know the population is huge around here. I have a row of arborvitae. And did I listen to my general manager at the time when I planted them? No. So what they did, believe it or not, like Lance talked about earlier, they have their same route they take, and they take that through my backyard. The one side, and it happens to be my side of the property, they eat. The other side, next to Helen's house, she's not here, they do not touch it at all. So, and I got another three feet past that as a barrier. So it's amazing as their routes is what I'm trying to get across. They will stick to it. I do not even spray, which I'll get into shortly, those side of those arborvitaes. I spray my side. And it works now. But my plants are gradually coming back. Well, and again, um, usually when you're going to want to spray, it's not so much in the summer that you have an issue with it, correct? I mean, usually in the wintertime is when you're going to want to worry about spraying more. So. Like the physical barriers and everything, again, Lance talked about it. A lot of times that's your best bet. Like on arborvitae, for instance, um, a lot of times if it's a newly planted. This is my arborvitae, <laughs> what I was talking about. <laughs> so that is the side of my neighbor. And you can see they are not touching my hydrangeas. But if you can, get a, you can see, I have spray marks on my hydrangeas because I'm, I'm a firm believer of sprayer, but I'll get into that. But that is my house. 
Yeah, and hostas really to me are just deer food. Like all my hostas in my yard and my lilies, I mean, they really are just deer food. They are there and we just let the deer pretty much demolish them. Yes, exactly, dessert. Um, they don't really bother my hydrangeas. I do not live in Rochester, I live further north. So I'm actually right up against a bunch of state property. So because they have a larger area, obviously, to feed on plants that are growing naturally, they are you know, less likely to bother the plants in my landscape. However, they still will because you gotta think of your plants in your yard as well. You know, They're taken care of, they're watered, they're fertilized, fertilized, everything like that, they're healthy, they're lush. So I mean, think about when you go out to eat, you're gonna go for you know, the more appetizing looking things than something that's kind of left over and not taken care of. Deer are kind of gonna do the same. Um, and again, our joke is that you know, deer can't read so we give you these sheets that tell you what they will and will not eat, but they don't know how to read, so they don't know what they are supposed to eat and what they're not. So they're gonna kind of sample everything. Like I said, that's why you'll see some feeding damage. Um, it might not be too bad at the beginning. Um, they might leave it alone, decide they don't like it. Um, other things, if it's something they like, obviously they might devour. Um, if it's younger plants in your yard, um, newly, like smaller, exactly, like a few bites off of a young plant, it's pretty, pretty much gonna demolish a plant. So there's a lot of times that we'll even see things come back that are deer resistant, um, that customers will bring back to us and they're like, okay, like I didn't even plant it yet. It was sitting on the side of my garage and I came out the next morning and it was gone. <laughs> so again, you know, this only goes so far. It's only so helpful. It's meant to be a good guideline. Obviously that has to be in conjunction with other things that you're doing, which includes spraying on um, physical barriers and stuff like that as well. Um, I've had people ask me, is there a way, like, can you try to plant things that are deer resistant or are going to act as like a deterrent? So can I put something that they're not going to like around the plants that I'm trying to protect? I don't really see that that works. Um, I don't know that there, there's really much success with that kind of, you know, to go that route. Really, I think you're just looking at, you know, being persistent with your repellents and everything, trying to stick with things that are potentially a little bit more deer resistant. So we did pick a few things um, on these different slides. Um, these would be different perennials for the sun that are considered more deer resistant. Um, annuals, um, Joe can attest more to annuals than I can. Daffodil's a bulb, it's not an annual, but you know we put it up there. Uh, there's a few different shrubs that are a little bit more deer resistant as well. Oh, I'm kind of jumping over. Wake up, okay. So again, this list is great. Shade perennials, ground covers. Um, you can go to our website too, so we do have pictures of everything. So if you want to go off this list, you can go to our website or even online, you'd be able to see a picture of what it looks for. So, ground covers, yeah. So, Pack uh, Sandra, yeah. I mean, and not saying that there's not things that aren't deer resistant. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, let's see, different, a few different trees. And I'll get into kind of going back to trees a little bit, and we'll touch base on it a little bit more towards the end. Um, a lot of people ask me about deer resistant trees. I'm gonna tell you right now that if uh, it's a new tree in your landscape, there's not really such thing, because um, during rutting season, uh, buck rub is a big issue. So they like to go after smaller trees. That's usually anything four inch caliber or less, they will snap them in half or strip them completely bare. Uh, so if you are planting a new tree, you always want to make sure to protect them. Physical barrier, like repellents aren't gonna work for something like that. You need to have like a physical barrier. So I'll talk a little bit more on that towards the end. So Joe's gonna take over for repellents because he's much more familiar with it. <laughs> okay, um, there's different things we can do. Obviously we have the liquid repellents and we have granular repellents. And we also have um, fences, which I do. Uh, I have a daylily garden on the side of the house and that's all that's on the side of this one side of my house is all my daylilies. Yes, you can grow daylilies, but you got to have what I have. I use the side of my house and then I have a seven foot fence right in front of it. Like Lance was talking about their flight pattern, they can't try. So from her to me is the width of my daylily bed and then the entire length of the side of my house, I have this fence up and it's up year round. Except for last fall, the fun deer, they came in, and it was all the males, and they're showing their dominance, and Lance can contest. They're very aggressive. I heard them. I did not go out. I knew what was going on. 
they were fighting each other, and they tore my whole fence down. But luckily, it's, it was the fall, so I wasn't worried about replacing it. I just replaced it about three weeks ago. And a good thing, because now all my dealers are coming up, and they're still there. So I recommend, if you can fence, do it. Um, it's a plastic black fence, so you can see through it. It's not that noticeable. I live up on a hill in Christian Hills, so you can't even see it from the road. I'm lucky. Our lots are quite large in the Christian Hills, anywhere from three quarters to an acre plus is our lot sizes. Um, we're one of the oldest subdivisions in Rochester Hills, so we're lucky we do have these larger lots. Um, the uh, best thing I can tell you is if you can fence, fence, okay? My vegetable garden is six feet by 12 feet, and it's entire fenced in all the way around. They did get in. They will find a way. And it's usually the younger deer are getting in there, and they eat all the tops of my tomatoes. All right, so I've reversed to, I fence it all around, and I put a top all the way at the top. Um, we all know I'm going to keep saying that deer are aggressive. Um, repellents. This is where, we, when you come in to sell, up to our store, and we recommend a repellent, and the first thing's out of her mouth, it doesn't work. Well, I ask her how it works, how she sprayed it. Well, I sprayed it three weeks ago. And I said, well, has it rained? And she says, I think so. Uh, have you have a sprinkling system in that area? I think so. Guess what? All that rain and all that sprinkler system basically washes it off. What I'm saying, you need to spray more than they say. Unfortunately, we put it on our slide once every 30 days. Can anybody guess how much I spray? Weekly, I, I spray my yard three times a week. We can contest. We have deer in our sub. And I still have a fence. I spray. That's how you saw that picture. I have hydrangeas. I spray. But I'm good at it. Okay? If you look at the slide, we have two slide pictures. One is liquid fence, which is my number one go-to. And our second go-to is deer stopper. And we have a new one that's called Mace this year. Um, it's another. And these are all organic products. So what I do, actually, I rotate these. I will do liquid fence for maybe about two weeks. And then I'll stop. And I'll do the deer stopper. And now that um, one of the buyers, she, he gave me a sample for the Mace, which I'm going to start trying here shortly, um, I'll be adding that into my mix. So what I'm trying to explain is the bottle is wrong with our area. We all know that. We all, that's why we're all here. I want you to do it more often. Okay? The biggest thing with the green bottle, the liquid fence, it stinks. It stinks bad. We don't like it. The deer don't like it. I go out usually at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and spray it because I'm very courteous of my neighbors. Uh, they have their windows open at night, especially during the summer. It'll smell, and it lasts about an hour. But I want you to spray, and I want you to spray often. That's the way we're going to beat these guys. Okay? The granulars, I don't get into all the granular stuff because what they can do, Kim's my hydrangea bush, and the granular girls down in my bed, they're just going to come up here and eat the leaves. Okay? I want it on the plants themselves. It does not hurt the plants because it smells bad. All it is, basically, and there are different formulations, is egg solids, garlic, oils, usually spearmint and peppermint, things that when you put them all together, they're pretty nasty. And they do not like it. Um, dried blood is another one. It's a product. You can use that. And they say to put it every four to six feet throughout the garden. But there again, you put it here, you put it over here, they're going to come right here and eat. So I want you to totally spray everything, all right? Not just singular areas when you spray. You think of anything else there, Kim? Yes. Well, I guess I have a question for you. So what would you recommend to them? Like, let's say you're going on vacation for a week or two. Like, what would be the best way? Because I know, like, the dry blood or people will try that up north. Um, but if you know you're going to be gone, like, what's the best way to try to protect your plants while you're gone? 
put right. me on the spot, Joe. <laughs> so the question is, when we're going on vacation, I usually go to vacation in August. Um, I'll spray either that morning or that night before I leave. And believe it or not, I hope for the best. Um, I've asked a neighbor to do it. They did it once, and they didn't like the smell. <laughs> so um, you can then go to put the extra granulars down and help because, um, like I said, they get in a habit. And they know when we are there and not there. I also have a dog. I have a golden retriever. Um, that tends to help because they know when he's out there. Uh, he'll chase them around, get them out of the yard, um, and they still come back when they know he's not out there. Um, so I would definitely spray right before the day or day of their vacation starting time, and then obviously right when you get back. Um, I hope that answers it. That's the best way I do it. Um, you hope the best. Now um, is everything's growing right now, so our hostas are coming up. Spray them now. Daylilies are coming up. Spray them now. I know they're this big, but get it now and go after it. If you don't, they're going to get you, and then you're going to be yelling at yourself so you didn't spray. Okay, sir, you had a question. Yes, is the spray already don't go to the question is the spray? Are they not going for it for the taste or the smell? Both, and believe it or not, they add fear in there too, because they sense it, they don't like it, so it's a fear with them as well. The new product, uh, uh, Mace, um, it actually writes fear on their bottle because of the smell. Actually, that one, um, I did the seminar here at Bordines just about three weeks ago, and I opened it. I hadn't opened it yet because we just got it like three days before our seminar, and I smelled it. It's very sweet smelling, so if you don't like the liquid fence, I'd get this one because we don't like things, but the deer definitely don't like it. So smell them if you want to. If you come into the store, I'd be glad to open a bottle and you can smell them. When I thought, um, didn't Mike say something about that one? Better for like vegetable use? Right. That? Our buyer, uh, Michael, he, uh, he told me, because he gave me a bottle to try at my yard because he knows my deer population. Um, it is one used for vegetables. You can spray it on the vegetables. I know it's kind of scary because we all clean our vegetables and stuff. Even though you're growing them in your yard, you still want to clean them. Um, so you're going to spray it off. Generally, I will spray the liquid fence or the deer stopper on my garden, and usually it's about a week or two before I harvest. But then again, I'm still going to wash them off. But it is an organic. Uh, physical barriers, we talked about it a little bit. The 8 to 10 foot fence is basically your best bet. I know they're unsightly. Uh, here in Christian Hills, we're not allowed to use fences. Um, but gardens, they don't get too upset about. We have a somewhat lenient group of people. Some people, I said some. Um, so you can do that. Like I said, I, I do the barrier. I do do my barrier on my side of the yard during the winter only. I'll put that black fence up during the winter, and I take it down in the spring for my arborvitaes. So if you can do what to do that, I know it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of money to replace. Well, and the so important thing to remember about that, too, is like if you're doing like the mesh, um, which, again, you're, it's, you're not really going to see it. You have to make sure it's not close enough where the deer can push through that to get to the plant because um, obviously it's going to be flexible. So usually you have to do stakes every so many feet apart, have that, you know, like a couple feet away from the plant so they can't push through that um, but not far enough away where they're obviously able to jump over it. And, again, it is a lot of work. Some people, you know, younger plants will opt to do like burlap screening, um, especially on arborvitaes because they are younger. Um, so, you know, they want to try to protect them from winter burn and stuff like that. And even we typically don't recommend wrapping the plant itself. We still kind of recommend the stake system just because it can sometimes cause them to dry out a little bit, beat up by the wind. So it can actually almost damage the foliage more by being physically wrapped than having the barrier. Um, so you could go either way with that. That obviously the burlap would offer protection from the winter as well as the deer. Again, you just have to have it far enough away. And one more thing I do get, I've had a few people ask me about like deer resistant arborvitae. Um, it's probably one of the most common questions I get asked. Uh, green giants are considered deer resistant, um, more deer resistant than what like your standard emeralds would be. They do get a little bit bigger. They'll get, you know, I think like 20, about 20 feet tall, 8 to 10. However, it's a <laughs> deer resistant arborvitae, and I say that with, co with quotations because they are still potentially going to feed on them. I've just, they're less likely to be damaged than like what your emeralds would be. 
Um, so I would definitely, if it's a high area of feeding, I would still definitely protect them just like you would any of your other arborvitae. Um, we're going to jump into the buck rub in the fall. Uh, I know Lance mentioned it real quick and Kim mentioned some things. That usually starts around September, December. What they're doing is getting all that felt off their um, antlers and they're marking their territories for the females. That's what they're doing and they're doing it to our trees. I planted a, a new, uh, what did I plant last, a couple years ago on the Father's Day? No, I can't remember. What was that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter because the deer got it. <laughs> it was, oh no, Chancellor Pear. And the deer did get it. It's my own fault. They actually scraped it. It was a brand new one and it was definitely under the four inch rule here like we say. They like the younger trees. They don't like the big trees like this. They're not going to go up. They're not going to rub these usually. They're going to rub the new, new, newly planted trees. The tree um, program that the city of Rochester Hills has, they're going to rub every single one of them. But what's great about when they plant them, if, ever, if anybody's taking advantage of it, they actually do put that fencing on the, the trunks of the trees. That is wonderful. What I've done, I've gone up to Home Depot here, and they have the drain tile. And it's a black tile, and I slid it down the side, and then I open it up, and I go right around the base of the tree. And you go from the ground all the way up to the first set of branches, and that worked. And then I also planted um, white pines, the same, actually a year before. And that, believe it or not, that was only this high, and they did scrape that. So now i got to do the same thing. i got to put that on there, too. So that's a real good one for the buck rub. You can also um, you can spray that area, too with the liquid fence or the um, deer stop or the new mace. You spray those areas. But I would definitely put something on it than rely on the spray. Because what they're doing, like um, we've said, they're marking their territory, OK? They're looking for the females so they can mate. Well, and the only thing I would say, too, about like protecting the trunks of the trees, um, like for like the drain tile, which is great, or even like some of like you can go buy like just like the bark guards and stuff like that, which is like a corrugated plastic. Uh, you don't want to leave that on year round. You don't want that moisture to get on right. the trunk of the tree. That will actually cause more problems. So that's really only for like winter protection, um, even in the fall, because rabbits and every rabbits and squirrels have been a bigger problem in my house for my trees than the deer have. Like they've decimated several of them. Um, but again, you know, you're going to get that feeding damage on the bottom and everything like that. Um, so if it's something that you're having an issue with, if you're looking to protect it season, round, you know, season long, you can do like even like stake kind of around the trunk of the tree, have like some sort of like metal barrier that's away from it um, that offers a protection but doesn't allow moisture to get under that. So they can't get to the trunk, they can't rub on it, but moisture isn't getting underneath that where it creates a problem. So that would be something that you could potentially leave up season long versus just for the few months that you're trying to protect it. That's good. Um, there's the buck rub damage we were talking of. Um, this is the, the first picture right here is um, they just put um, the chicken wire around it. That works wonderful. Um, just be careful when you're putting those on that you can break the uh, skin of the trunk. So just be careful when you do that. You can see the buck there, what he's doing, and obviously what he did do to it. And um, they are persistent. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've had customers bring in pictures where you could see where they they made an effort to actually put up a physical barrier and like the buck just plowed right through it and got to the tree anyway and snapped in half on some of those younger trees. So kind of using like a multi-system approach, you know, whether that be repellents, you know, physical barrier, things like that would probably be the best way to go. Um, but yeah, they definitely like those younger trees. That's what they're going to be going after. And the biggest thing is when they usually come and they spend, customers bring in a picture like that. That one, we could probably still can still save that tree. And what we're going to recommend is to tie it back up and then get the tree wrap and wrap it on there to save it for the winter. Um, just make sure, like Kim said, to get it taken off in the spring. I've already taken all the stuff off my trees. Um, we want everything to start growing again properly. You're not scraping it. Anything else on that? Not that I can think. Is that good on deer buck rub? Yes. Question over here, yes. Okay, your question is on her trees that she had at home was, um, she, it's a pretty good sized trunk on it, it seems like, and they've rubbed pretty deep into the tree and she wants to know the tree's going to survive. The only way we can say now is wait for it to see the new leaves coming up or the flowers coming up, and then we'll go from there. If you start seeing that, then you should be okay. 
Um, we do have sprays at, at work that um, is the, the black tar spray. We can, you can put that on there. But if it is, if you're growing and it looks like it normally is every, like every other year, you should be fine. Sometimes yeah. I will say that like you will, like it'll leaf out and then all of a sudden it'll start to decline. It, um, you know, that is a possibility. There's nothing at this point that you can do to treat it other than just time. Like, time is going to tell. Um, like I said, there's nothing that you can do to fix the damage that's already there. Uh, you'd be amazed at some of the trees that I've seen that, like, I'm, there, like, there's no way it's going to survive. And, like, three years later, I mean, we have one that was stripped all the way around in our parking lot um, by a rabbit, not a deer, but it was all the way around um, in all intents and purposes that should have killed the tree. And three years later, it's still alive. You know, and then I've seen others that, like, just halfway, you know, ends up, you know, killing the tree. So, like Joe said, time is going to kind of tell. Um, if it doesn't do anything this spring, it's probably not looking so good. But, like I said, sometimes it can flush out, and then, you know, later in the year or even the following year, you'll see it decline. So. Okay, we're open to questions, and Lance is going to come back up, too, so we can ask questions with Lance or Kim and I. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Question is, she has a beautiful hosta garden, it sounds like, and they're not getting her till later on in the season. I'd recommend spraying now because um, all it takes is one. And if they start doing it now, you're going to have some weird-looking hostas when they try to grow. So I would do it now. Um, I have hostas in the front yard of our house on the side, closer to my daily side, and generally I don't spray that area. Um, it's a ribbed type of hosta with ribs in the leaves. Um, and they generally don't go for that, generally. Um, and I wasn't spraying that area. I do have annuals in some pots in that area. I'm sorry. Um, and I missed spraying it, and they got me. Same time frame you were talking about, later on in the season. So um, definitely spray. That's all I can say. She asked if we have any idea how many how many coyotes. Not really. It's not something that we um, that we track too much. But I think it's probably not as many as as most people think because their home range is really large and they're super territorial. We actually um, Wayne State did a a study on our coyotes here in Rochester Hills. They radio collared them and 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 then followed them around essentially. And one of them um, was killed three months after it was radio collared in Orion Township. Yeah, so they they um, they can have a, a, a six to eight mile square mile home range, unlike the deer that stay fairly fairly local. How do you know it was killed by a coyote? Yeah, that that deer that deer had been hit by a car before it was killed by a coyote. It had broken. In where? No, they, they, what happens with these deer, like probably it got hit on Walton okay. and traveled its way. Like Lauren and I pick up about between 60 and 70 deer that are hit by cars and die on private property. If they're hit on the road, that's someone else's problem. But um, Oftentimes, it's near a main road. They very seldom get hit in a subdivision. So the other thing I, I, I wanted to mention again is that what works for one person other than fencing may not work for, for you. And the reason for that is, is the motivation factor of the deer. Like I, I talked about it just a little bit. Deer that live in, in areas that have lots of natural habitat where there's mast trees, there's oaks and hickories and all the things that they like to eat naturally, those deer aren't as motivated to come into a, a, into a neighborhood where they're uncomfortable. But if you live in a, in a really populated area like Fairview, um, Chichester, those places, um, those deer are highly motivated so they're harder to stop. And you have to change things up more often, more frequently, like Joe said, I'm a big believer in changing the repellents that you use and not just use the same one. When you're in one of these motivated areas, then, then looking at using the burlap and these other barriers to, um, to, protect, to protect your landscaping um, is, is, is going to be necessary. Got it. His question is, why do I recommend 
changing the scent or the repellents that I'm using. Um, just like you and I, we get used to something. They'll get used to something, and they're going to eat it. So that's why I rotate it. So it's more of a, and maybe it's just my head thinking this, but I don't think so. I think they get used to it, and they're going to come and get me. Because they, believe it or not, I said they weren't getting my hydrangeas. They've gotten my hydrangeas before, and that's just because of my fault, fault too. I might miss a, a few days that's sprayed, or we had rain for four or five days straight. And that's my fault for not going out there. I'm going out there tonight. Believe it or not, I am. I'm not just saying this. I'm going out there tonight, and I'm spraying. I've been gone. I was gone all last week, and my wife does not spray. Lance will contest this. She, she won't do it. I, I do it. Um, so I'll be doing that tonight. But I, I recommend doing it. Just rotate it. it. Like I said, it might just be this thinking, but I think it's more them. They get used to things. Good question. Yes. She asked about, about how these areas are getting developed that, that in the past, um, Hamlin and Livernois, there, were, there, were, there was a woodlot on one side and a big open fallow field that we'd go by and, and see deer and all kinds of things out there, and that, that's all been developed now. And so that, that for sure is what, is what happens. The lack of their natural habitat forces them to, to come into our yards and feed on those, on, on, on those plants. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. She asked if, you should, if, if we should be afraid of, of coyotes, and, and the short answer is no. Um, they're they're, they're uh, by nature afraid of humans. And, but what I will say is that it's just like, like with the deer or other wild animals that live in, in subdivisions, the best thing to do is to keep them wild. And we, we promote hazing coyotes, banging, making loud noises, waving your arms, yelling at them. Um, I even run at them and make them take off so that they know that, that they're not welcome and, and, it's, and it's, they don't get used to being comfortable in, in, in your yards. But no, they're not, they're not interested in, in you. They, the majority of their diet are small mammals, um, metal voles, mice, chipmunks, squirrels, and their favorite is the cottontail rabbit. So. Yes. Um, no, I don't think I don't think that, that foxes are any more noticeable or higher population than than any other time. It's just certain areas. Coyotes and foxes don't get along. So when there's when there's a coyote in the area, you're not going to see a fox. And so you might just be in an area where there aren't any coyotes, and you have a fox den that um, you've seen more than one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's probably a den situation that they that they have their tits in. Yes. He asked if it's if, if it's likely that a deer is going to give birth in the same spot over and over, and it does happen like that on a pretty regular basis. And here's the interesting thing about it, at least interesting to me, is the deer have have come to realize that they have a better chance of having having a successful fawning season in your backyard than out in the woods. And so they do that they do that on purpose. They they come in, I mean they'll have their fawns right in someone's flower bed right outside their uh, off their deck or next to their front porch and it's because they know they're safer by people than they are out there where they've got to deal with all the natural uh, predation and, and elements that that take them. So it, it's become a lot more common these calls that we get about about fawns that are actually in in people's yards. Or hunting in gardens. Oh, <laughs> any anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I think she said that that she's noticed that because of the invasive species, there's there's less of the native plants that that you would think that you would find in these in these wooded areas and that's only part of it that's true that that garlic mustard and some of the other in, invasives especially um, a vine called bittersweet there's another shrub called honeysuckle that's real dense and, and forms these um, hedgerows but it's but it's also a function 
of the, of the deer feeding on the native plants. And that's, how, that's why invasives are invasives. They're not native, and so they don't have things that are eating them, whereas trillium and, and all the, the, the flowers that you should find in a, in a woodland pretty much get eaten by deer. So we've taken to, like with our green space initiative, um, we've started to try to turn things back to native prairies and and um, we've got a burn coming up tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and with the, with the whole idea behind it is to restore the native habitat and get rid of the invasives. But it's, a, it's an uphill battle, it's, it's, it's tough, for sure. Well, the deer eat that some of them they do, you know, but it, like some of the, the, the prairie plants, the tall grasses and, and the, the, those, those things like little blue stem and Indian grass, and they, don't, they don't bother too much. Now, some of the other things like um, cone flowers, pretty, pretty tough because that's, nice, that's a nice plant to have. It, you know, there's a number of different colors, but they seem to, they seem to key in on it. But um, giant ironweed we grow out here in our prairie, and they don't bother that. And so there's some of the, some of the native, native prairie species they don't bother. I mean, it's in the, yes, um, but like our list is not comprehensive by all means. Um, we kind of tried to stay away from things that wouldn't necessarily be higher up on the list as far as more deer resistant. And like I said, what I we did is we took like 20 different sources and like kind of cross-referenced each one. So if it was like conflicting information on multiple different sources that we looked at, we kind of didn't want to add that on our sheet because Again, it was conflicting information. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, it could be, you know, they're very habitual and everything like that. But like I said, this is not comprehensive. And like even on our signs and everything like that, like a lot of our perennials are deer resistant. Um, that doesn't mean every perennial that we have is on the list. Um, it's actually used for what chemical is it that we use it? It's, um, it's a pesticide. Chrysanthemum oils. It's a type. It's a type of pesticide. It's possible, um, I because I don't know. Like as far as like your mums and everything like that. Do you know? Like is that like deer resistant? Okay. Yeah. So I mean I don't know if there's enough of it in like if it's in enough of a concentrate in the plant itself to be an issue. Like that I'm not aware of. Um, but yes, you are correct that it is. It is used as a pesticide. There's like a organic pesticide. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but yes, they do use chrysanthemum oil. Um, but yeah, like I said, our list isn't necessarily comprehensive and I would def definitely recommend for any of you to like check out MSU's extension website. Um, they have a very good source of information. They have a lot of like local, like native plants and stuff on there as well. We kind of stuck to like cultivars, things that we sold. So it's definitely not a comprehensive list as far as that goes. Okay. Well, y'all, y'all heard it and then if it. If they eat them, then you know who to blame. No, I'm just kidding. Her question was about Shasta daisies, oh, and is is that is that the type of daisy that we grow at Innovation? Yeah. yeah so yeah. we've had okay. we've had good luck with it too, um, over over at the at the new park. So that's a good one. Okay. Oh, he asked okay. about May apple, which is a which is a, a, a native wildflower. Um, kind of, you've probably all seen it before. It's got a big umbrella-like leaf, and the and the flower is actually underneath the leaf. They're kind of they're kind of neat, but they grow they they, they spread and grow in uh, in a fairly dense mat, and there can be you know there can be fifty or sixty of them in one in one area. Um, so yeah, they, that's one flower that still that still survives the deer woods. Well, I want to th oh one more. Well, the question was home remedies. Um, home remedies, it's that thinking again. We're thinking that. Um, our neighbor, he uses the Irish Springs, and I tell him all the time, no, 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 it's not going to work. And he's got a bunch of roses on the fence line, and he tries to put that there. It doesn't work. And then he tried the hair. He went to a local barber and got a bunch of hair, and he tried that. I've heard that, too. Yeah. It's to each his own. Personally, I want, to, want you to spray. I want you to, I want you to touch the stuff because 
like I said, if Lance is one plant, I'm another plant, and Kim's the third plant, and we have it and she doesn't, they're going to go to that third plant and eat it. Okay? They might keep walking when they smell it, but they're going to get you to the next plant. Yeah. So, I mean, you could try home remedies, but I say no. <laughs> In the back there, yes. Okay, she, she said that um, she was seeing five or six deer, and then, and then one day that there, there were 17 or 18, and is that, is that typical? That's going to come to an end, and they're going to they're gonna break up, and the, the, the mature does that, that are going to give birth, their, their fawns from last year go on their own, and the doe that's going to give birth does that by herself. And that, that's the other thing with them, too. The first time that they give birth, they typically have a single fawn, and after that, they have twins. And every now and then, they have triplets. So, but yeah, you're, 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 that, that whole dynamic of a large number of deer together is gonna, is, is gonna come to an end here pretty soon. Oh, one, you have another question? Scare them away. She asked about wild turkeys. We have them all over the park. There's a, a large number of them um, now, and they, they, they keep getting more and more prevalent. But um, the, big, the big thing is scaring them off. It, just like just like with any with any wild animal, we want them to stay wild and be afraid of us, and and behave like like wild animals should. So, well, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thanks to Board Ein for coming and helping us again, and uh, good luck gardening.